Thank you. Please be seated. Today's gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of John. Once again, Jesus is preparing his disciples before he departs from them, after he fulfills his purpose upon this earth. Hear this good word. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. So, what is the Advocate? Some might say, well, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay. What's the Holy Spirit? Well, the Advocate. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> biting my tongue, biting my tongue, biting my tongue. <laughs> Very funny. All right. I believe that the Advocate, that the Holy Spirit, is our spirit working consciously with the divine. That's what I believe it is. I am consciously aware of this inner voice, this spirit within me, that part of me which is eternal. I am consciously aware of my spirit and the fact that my spirit is working along with the divine. That's what I think it is. Some might call it intuition. You know what intuition is? We all hear that voice in our head every once in a while. Sometimes we listen to it, sometimes we don't. I have heard so many stories about a woman who says there's something wrong with my baby. She goes to her doctor and her doctor says, no, no, everything's fine. You're just worried about being a new mother. No, something is wrong with my baby until she persists to find out that something was wrong with her baby. Intuition, advocate, Holy Spirit. Some of us might think, you know, I really need to be going this direction. And then something in us says, you know, why don't you slow down and maybe try another some of us are living our lives out of control and that something pops inside of our heads as you know if you keep going this direction if you keep doing these things horrible things are going to happen you really need to stop and get some help advocate holy spirit intuition it's what i believe it is that somehow we can slow ourselves down and listen to that eternal voice which lives within each and every one of us well, how do we know we're listening to the Advocate? How do we know we're doing what the Spirit wants us to do? It's a good question. And the answer is in our scripture passage for you. Start out with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Many of us here have never read the whole Bible. I've read the whole Bible. And some of the books in the Bible, like books I've read in other places, I don't care to ever read them again. <laughs> but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these books I know. Why do I focus so much energy on it? Because I am a follower of Jesus. Why do I follow Jesus? Because I believe that his life, as portrayed in those four books, give us the most accurate description of the true nature of God. And also, I believe that Jesus, for me, 
is a beautiful example of what it means to fulfill my humanity as a creature on this planet and also as an eternal soul, both working together. That's why. So if what the inner voice is telling you is something drastically inconsistent with what his teachings are, then maybe that's a time to listen to that other voice that says, let's pause for a moment and take a deeper look. Now, notice that I said, follow the teachings of Jesus. Those who love me, he said, will obey my teachings. Follow his teachings, not the church's tradition teachings, not religious teachings. Why would I say that? It's pretty obvious in our country today, as I see people who represent the church saying and doing absolutely horrible things that seem to me to be obviously extremely inconsistent with his teaching. If the religion you practice and the faith community you worship with is consistent with those teachings, then I think we're in a good spot. Let's continue to look there. Let's continue to grow there. I find myself in a strange place as I talk about this. As I'm warning you, beware of what the Christian church is trying to tell you. Beware of religion because of what it's trying to do to manipulate you. It's strange for me to hear it coming out of my mouth because, after all, I'm an ordained minister who serves a church. Right? But I'm also keenly aware that Jesus was once a Jew who challenged his religion on a regular basis. In fact, his religion was so threatened by his challenges, they declared him a blasphemer and decided he had to die. So I don't think there's anything at all wrong with challenging our religion. But you say, Pastor Barton, isn't what the church says and the religion that's practiced the same thing? I don't think so. Does this mean all churches are bad? No. Does this mean all religions are bad? Absolutely not. But any religion that's teachings and its practices are consistent with the teachings of Jesus, I believe, are living on the right track with this advocate, this spirit, this intuitive voice. So are all churches bad? No. But I believe that some churches have lost their way. And they've lost their way because they're so caught up in their moralistic ideals, their political and cultural beliefs, that they have lost the teachings of Jesus in trying to project those beliefs onto the masses. It's nothing new. It's been going on for such a long time. But Pastor Barton, how do you know that as they do these things, it's not the spirit that's teaching them and guiding them to do so? Hmm, good question. Is what they're saying and what they're doing consistent with who Jesus was and what he teaches? What we do says a lot more than about what we say. What I see these very devout and religious people doing is using selective literalism to justify their points of view. What's that? There will be people who say, I believe the Bible literally from the beginning to the very end. Wonderful. But it's a big fat lie. Because you can't. It doesn't say the same thing all the way. What we see from Genesis to Revelation is an evolution of belief and faith and history and all those things that affect the way people interpret and understand God. What they're really saying is there are selected pieces of scripture that I can go to to prove my point of view. For example, if I believe... Women are inferior to men. No hisses and boos. God cannot call a woman to lead a congregation and preach and be ordained. And a woman's place is in the home and she's to be subservient to the will of her husband. (laughs) 
I was rather surprised all those boos sounded like low baritones. I, <laughs> maybe those are men who have tried this and failed. I don't know. But here's the thing. I can go to the Bible and select specific scriptures to prove that point of view. I can do that. I can do that. What if we believe that people of color somehow are lesser than white people? I can go to those scriptures which ironically were written in the Middle East where there are more black-haired brown people than there are white people, and I can take those scriptures and prove that point. I can select specific scriptures out of context to make my point of view. What if I believe that homosexuality and the LGBT community is an abomination before God? I can go to selected scriptures and make that point of view and claim that God said it. What if, and oh, I have a deep conviction about this. What if I say that eating shrimp, not fried shrimp, but shrimp in general, is an abomination before God? What if I teach that eating bacon offends God. I wouldn't yet. See, there you go. <laughs> and if you are sitting here today and you eat shrimp wrapped in bacon, you're going on a grease slide to hell. <laughs> People don't take the Bible literally. If we took the Bible literally, we would have Sabbath from sundown Friday to sunrise, sundown Saturday night. The only people I know who do that are the Seventh-day Adventists, who I don't think eat shrimp. <laughs> See, so what is the purpose of selective literalism? Selective literalism takes specific scriptures to justify the evil intent while validating their evil behavior declaring God justifies it and supports it. That's the purpose. That is the purpose of it. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So, all religion is not the same. All churches are not the same. All teachings of the church are not the same. How do we know which one is right or which one is wrong? I'm not omniscient enough to be able to, do, to answer that. But I do know this, that if I live my life following the life and the teachings of Jesus, I'm probably going to be okay. And I believe that as a community decides to come to a place to worship, and we place first and foremost the teachings of Jesus and the way he lived his life, and we emulate that and, and, and evolve into that ourselves, we're going to be okay. Well, isn't Windermere Union Church a religious institution? I mean, Windermere Union Church, United Church of Christ. It's got a lot of that religious stuff in his name, does it not? So let's not look at so much what we say, but what we do. How much time and energy do we spend, or do I spend, talking about who's right and who is wrong? Who is in and who is out? Whom God loves and whom God hates? What doctrines are the correct doctrines and which ones are the wrong doctrines? Which are the right polities uh, of, of the church and which ones are the wrong ones? Who is more right than that? How much time and energy do I spend or do we spend in that? See, those are things that typically religions are about. They need very specific rules. To define very clearly who everybody is, what they need to do, who's in and who is out, who's right and who's wrong. If the Windermere Union Church has a rule, I believe this is what the rule is. Anyone who comes through their doors will be welcomed and embraced and loved for who they are right here and right now. That's it. 
We don't care what color your skin is. We don't care what your sexual orientation is. We don't care what political party you are affiliated with. We want you to come through those doors and know what it is like to be embraced and to be loved unconditionally. That, if we have a rule, is our rule. I believe that Jesus' teachings push us and compel us and challenge us to step out of our comfort zones, to, to open our minds and our hearts to, to more complicated ideas and more complicated cultures that we're not looking for easy answers. Right, Jesus' teachings for me push me and help want me to evolve to be a more compassionate person. That's what this teachings do. Jesus' teachings for me want me to help to create a community of like-minded people. Not to mold them into an image I need them to be to keep my job, but rather embrace our differences and show each other and the world around us that we can be incredibly different, but we know how to love one another. To quote the great Forrest Gump, I may not be the smartest man in the world, but I do know what love is. I do know it is here. I do know that it's here. Whether we're the right religion or the wrong religion, whether we're the right doctrines or the doc right, wrong doctrines, I don't know. But I do know that love is here. What the teachings of Jesus do for me is it compels us to be healers of those who are broken. It teaches us to, to, to be compassionate and not judgmental. Later in the passage, he says, I am giving you peace, not, not the peace of the world, but the kind of peace that I can give you. So, so what is the peace? What is the peace? I can only share this with you from my perspective, because I don't know what it is for you. And, and I qualify what I'm saying is because, especially for you new people, I have no expectations that you will hear every word I say and agree with it, and you have to believe it because I said it. But all I can do is share with you from my life journey what these things mean in hopes that it will help you along with yours. So what does this piece mean? Earlier in my life, I would think that because I follow the teachings of Jesus, it has given me a ticket to heaven, and I don't have to worry about my eternal destiny. I believe that the teachings in the life of Jesus are much bigger than that. I believe all souls go to the same eternal realm. And when we die, we go to this place where we meet our, our inner circle and our friends and our teachers and our guides. And first of all, we just recover from what it is like to live on this harsh planet. I believe that from there, we go on about looking at how we have been wounded and we heal from those wounds. And we also look at how we have wounded others and we learn from that so we can't have to do it again. So... Believing and loving Jesus and his teachings has nothing to do with getting my ticket to heaven. So what is the peace that he brings to me? My peace is this. That after growing up and inheriting a fundamentalist, conservative religious tradition that was full of fear and guilt shame, fire, brimstone, and grease slides to hell. I have somehow been able to evolve and overcome that fear. And somehow my peace now is not that somehow I know because I'm following the rules that I'm in the will of God. My peace comes from this, that I know from the Greek word gnosko, I know experientially, I know through even the marrow of my bones, that I am doing the best I can to consciously live in an awareness that I'm more than my five senses. I'm more than a human being on this planet. But there's something about me that is eternal. See? And I get my peace by knowing that I love the teachings of Jesus. I tr work every day to... to 
to live them, to understand them, to, to teach them. And that my peace comes from that somehow I know that my spirit and the spirit of the divine are working together. I don't worry about it anymore. I don't worry about it anymore. I, I, I don't worry about being rejected by God or anybody else. Some of that comes from being 60, I know, but it's a good place to be. I don't worry anymore about being abandoned. I don't. I, I don't worry anymore of being punished. I don't worry anymore about making mistakes. Some of my greatest wisdom, as great as it can be, is from the mistakes I have made in learning from them. I no longer worry. I no longer have fear of always being right. I'm not always right. Amy reminds me of that almost every day. There's no fear of having to be right. My peace comes from knowing those stories so intimately and incorporating them into my psyche and into my body and into my creativity and knowing my peace is knowing that I am doing the best I can to consciously walk with the divine. And I do my best every day. My peace comes from knowing it's not a contest. It's not a race. My peace comes from knowing that some days I'm much better at it than I am at others. My peace knows that progress in life spiritually and mentally and psychologically is not straight linear, but it's going forward, taking a few steps back. Oh, going forward, taking a few steps back. There we go again. Forward, growing. And it goes like this. It's evolving. It's growing. It's developing a confidence. My peace. Where is my peace? My peace is in knowing, gnosko, experientially, that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. There's my peace. And my peace comes from knowing that I live with this awareness every day. The teachings of Jesus. If you love me, you will obey my teachings. In the gospel stories, Jesus met people where they were. If they needed to be forgiven, he forgave them. If they needed to be healed, he healed them. If they needed to learn, he taught them when they were ready. If they needed to be scolded, because they used the religion and the culture to oppress others, then he scolded them. But above all, Jesus loved and embraced every human being he encountered. If there needs to be a rule of the church, of the religion, of the institution, then let's make that the rule. Love and embrace every human being you encounter. But some human beings are pretty rotten, nasty scoundrels. I know. Well, I can love those who love me and who are easy to love. And Jesus said, but anybody can do that. The call of Christ and the call of his teachings is for us to be able to expand, go beyond. And there are plenty of people in history who have somehow been able to rise to those levels. There are plenty of mentors and beautiful human beings on this planet who can show us that, yes, it can be done. I showed you a video not long ago of a woman who, when her murder of her son was let out of jail, she got him an apartment right next to hers. And even though he feels, still feels guilty about killing her son, they are the best of friends and she is like a mom to him. I know it can be done. Because that's what the teachings and the life of Jesus teaches. Live like this, and we will do much more than find our peace. 
Follow the te- know the teachings of Jesus. Follow the teachings of Jesus. Know his life. Emulate his life. And you will do so much more than discover your peace. But you will find that you have now, through this advocate, through this spirit, through this inner eternal voice, that you can become empowered to to fulfill your dreams and your purpose on this planet. And that as we individually and corporately choose consciously to obey and love, not only do we change ourselves, but we are a part of God's great plan the great spirit, the great advocate to make this place on earth healthier, more loving, and more peaceful. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray. O eternal spirit, You have placed a consciousness within each of us that is not far from your own. For the humanity of Christ is the humanity that's in us. The power to overcome, the power to thrive in spite of, the power to choose to love anyway is within each of us. The ability to become our fullest expression of who you created us to be is in each and every one of us. So it is my prayer for myself and those whom you love and those who are obedient to your teachings that we each and every one not only live into that fullness, but we become committed to help each other to be the best human beings we can be. So that we are living more fully what your spirit teaches and guides us to do each and every day. Amen.